Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Robert Birnbaum? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Robert Bierenbaum and Gail Katz met in the early 1980s. Robert was a surgical resident who was described as intelligent and socially awkward. His father was a physician. Robert had a pilot's license and frequently flew small planes. Gail had been working various jobs in Manhattan as she went to college. She would eventually pursue a PhD in psychology. She was described as intelligent, depressed, and as having low self-esteem. She had injured her arm at one point and had a difficult recovery and once attempted to bring an end to her own life. Gail was happy to find Robert. She thought that he was a good match for her. For one of their dates, Robert flew them over New York City in a small plane. The couple would soon become engaged. Robert continued to work as a resident as Gail worked as a personal assistant to wealthy people. Friends and family members of Gail noticed some warning signs in the relationship early on, like they were concerned about Robert specifically. Some of the warning signs were subtle, but many were obvious. For example, Robert would fly into a rage from time to time. He was controlling. On one occasion, he tried to drown Gail's cat in a toilet because he believed that she loved the cat more than him. An ex-girlfriend said that he tried to kill her cat as well through strangulation as opposed to drowning. On August 29, 1982, Robert and Gail married. Many people were concerned for Gail's safety and for her happiness, but she said that her love would cure Robert. She thought that she could change him into what she needed. Largely because they received money from Robert's family, the couple lived a luxurious lifestyle. They took vacations to the Caribbean and would go on ski trips. In January of 1983, they moved into a famous apartment building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It's the building featured in the opening segment of the television series, The Jeffersons. Moving on up, however, did not solve their relational problems. The couple would frequently fight, which would include screaming and verbal abuse. Robert was the aggressor most of the time. He had certain rules that he wanted Gail to follow. She needed to obey a schedule that he created, dress in a certain way. She wasn't permitted to smoke cigarettes. During one dinner with other people, he made Gail sit on his lap. Gail became increasingly afraid of Robert and simultaneously wanted to see him more. She said that she was lonely, he was never home, and his demeanor was cold. On November 8, 1983, Gail walked out to the balcony to smoke. This, of course, was against Robert's rules. He strangled her into unconsciousness. When she regained consciousness, he apologized. Gail went to the police and reported the attack. They really didn't do anything. Robert sought mental health therapy, which Gail demanded after he tried to kill her. The mental health clinician who treated Robert was named Dr. Michael Stone. After treating Robert for a short time, Dr. Stone was shocked at how dangerous Robert was. He even wrote a letter to Gail advising her that she would not be safe with Robert. Dr. Stone said this is the only letter he ever wrote of any type as a practitioner. That's how shocking Robert was. That's how worried Dr. Stone became after treating him. The letter said that Gail and Robert should separate. If Gail chose to remain with Robert, she would hold Dr. Stone harmless. He essentially wanted to be absolved of any responsibility. He was warning her, and if she didn't heed the warning, that was on her. One question that comes up here is how was Dr. Stone allowed to write this letter? What about confidentiality. There are two events that could have occurred here. One, Robert may have given him permission. And two, because this was a safety issue, Dr. Stone could have written the letter under the Tarasoff rule. This is the famous legal case in California, which led to the duty to warn being adopted in many jurisdictions. Clinicians are required to warn people who may be harmed by their clients. Now, this can't be a casual thing, like the client just makes some type of informal statement when they're angry. It has to be a threat that the clinician considers serious. 
Gail read the letter, but told friends and family that she almost had a PhD in psychology. She knew that Robert would change. She knew better than Dr. Stone. Gail said that if Robert did not change, she would release the letter. So she thought she had something over Robert that would keep her safe. At this point in their marriage, the couple was not having sex, Gail was dating other men, and sleeping with her clothes on. On July 7, 1985, one of Gail's former clients called her. This was a client from when Gail was a personal assistant to the wealthy. Gail was excited to hear that this person called, thinking that perhaps the client would give her work, but the client wanted to talk to Robert for a referral. Not long after this, Robert and Gail entered into a long and vociferous argument. Neighbors heard the argument, and then all of a sudden, there was silence. Robert drove to an airport in Essex County, New Jersey, rented a plane, and flew it over the ocean for about two hours. After landing, he went to a birthday party in New Jersey. He told somebody at that party that Gail left after being angry. He did not know where she was. Robert reported Gail missing on July 8th. Now he was saying that she had walked to Central Park and never returned. He also said that she was mentally ill and may have been killed in a drug deal gone bad. Instead of helping to search for Gail, Robert went to a spa on Long Island. He was quite dismissive of the idea of finding Gail. He started going on dates with other women. He told one of those dates that he hired a private investigator who found Gail. She had moved to California and found a job as a waitress. Robert never told the police about how he rented the plane on July 7. His alibi was that he was at home, went to the birthday party in New Jersey, and then returned home afterward. The police found out about the plane rental in August of 1986. They believed that Robert murdered Gail, put her body in the airplane, and then threw her body out of the plane over the ocean. In May of 1989, a torso washed up on Staten Island. The body was falsely identified as Gail, and buried in a cemetery using her name. Robert would leave New York that same year. He moved to Reno, Nevada. He would meet a woman there named Stephanie Youngblood. He and Stephanie would regularly fly to Mexico, where he would perform surgeries for no charge. This was part of a charity. He told people he was cleared of wrongdoing as far as the disappearance of his wife, Gail. Robert proposed to Stephanie, but she rejected him. She had noticed his episodes of rage. Like Gail, Stephanie demanded that Robert see a therapist. After one session with Robert, the therapist declared him to be dangerous. So he wasn't really making good impressions on clinicians. Robert went on a proposal spree, proposing to one woman after the other until finally a woman named Janet said yes. Robert and Janet moved to North Dakota in June of 1996. Robert was indicted for second-degree murder in September of 1999. There really hadn't been any new evidence except for DNA testing, which showed that the body found on Staten Island did not belong to Gail. This was not inculpatory, it was exculpatory. This meant that no one could be sure that Gail was dead. The prosecution only had a few items to use against Robert. He had a history of abusing Gail. She was planning on leaving him when she disappeared. He rented a plane on the day she disappeared and lied to the police about it. He altered his flight log in a haphazard way to disguise the date, changing it from 7-7 to 8-7, and there were people who were allowed to testify about the letter from Dr. Stone, although the jury never read the letter because it was privileged. So the jury could only hear about it from other people who read it. This was actually a landmark case. It set a precedent that even if a Tarasoff exception is made, that does not waive clinician-client privilege. Robert was convicted and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. He initially maintained his innocence, but at a parole hearing in 2020, he admitted that he murdered Gail. He said he just wanted her to stop yelling, so he strangled her. He then dumped her body from the plane, just as the investigators had thought. Robert said he committed the murder because he was immature. Now moving to my analysis. The case against Robert Bierenbaum was very weak, but considering that he now confessed, it seems clear that he is guilty. There are a few items that stand out in this case that I'll talk about here. Item number one, Robert was remarkably consistent throughout his life. He had a temper, would often fly into a rage, 
often appeared disheveled, was socially awkward, rude, controlling, and creepy. Robert was not a sophisticated manipulator like we would often see in a case like this. He was simple. He did not attract women because he was charismatic, stylish, or sensitive. He was attractive because he was a surgeon and would engage in primitive love-bombing behavior, like taking first dates up in an airplane. He was able to leverage his career and financial success to find romance. Even with this advantage, many women rejected him. There was something obvious that they saw in him that was a deal-breaker, specifically his temper. Amazingly, several different mental health therapists were alarmed at how dangerous Robert was. Typically, when people have obvious flaws, like having episodes of rage, they can still do a fairly good job of hiding it from mental health clinicians, especially in the short run. Robert was unable or unwilling to attempt to trick the clinicians. It's like he just didn't care, or he did not know how others would perceive him. This would be consistent with his disheveled appearance. He really didn't make any effort or seem to understand how to dress appropriately for different situations. Item number two, it can be very difficult for a wife to leave her husband, even if she is being mistreated. This really goes for anyone leaving their partner, regardless of gender. There are so many reasons for a married couple to stay together. Convenience, finances, housing, and every once in a while, love. I know many people consider that rare, but it does occur on occasion. I think it's telling that Gail was both afraid of Robert and missed him at the same time. She was ambivalent. She had strong feelings in two directions. There were many warning signs available to Gail, just to name a few. Robert's controlling behavior, the fact that Robert would yell at her, tell her that she was worthless and not good enough. He became physically violent and almost killed her in 1983. Her friends and family repeatedly warned her about her husband's behavior, and Robert's mental health clinician wrote a letter telling Gail that Robert was dangerous and that she should leave. In addition to Dr. Stone, Gail was actually warned by two other clinicians who treated Robert. Not wanting to believe in what was obviously true, Gail cited her time in a PhD program as protective against harm. Certainly, she would know the signs she would realize that Robert was dangerous if he really was. This is a great example of why mental health clinicians cannot treat themselves or anyone who they are close to. No level of training would protect Gail because she was involved in the situation. She was biased due to being married to Robert. She needed to believe that she could salvage the relationship. Moving to the last item, number three, what does this case tell us about Robert's personality and did his personality contribute to the murder? In order for a person to be a surgeon, they typically have to have a few different characteristics. Low neuroticism, coldness, callousness, and being emotionally detached. These characteristics allow them to cut a person and not feel emotions. This is a good thing as far as being a competent surgeon. Nobody wants a surgeon who has trouble regulating their mood. These same characteristics, however, can make it easier for someone to kill at least from an emotional standpoint. When surgeons do commit murder, it is often calculated. That's what makes this case so unusual. Robert's level of neuroticism was such that he was low in the facets that would make him a good surgeon, like he was low in anxiety, but he may have been high on the facet of anger. He could not control his emotions in the context of a romantic relationship, but he could control them when performing surgery or when flying an aircraft. Just because somebody has a job that's traditionally associated with remaining calm doesn't mean they can stay calm in every situation. What lesson can we learn in this case? Many people think that when homicide occurs in a marriage or other long-term committed relationship, deception and manipulation must be involved. In this case, the perpetrator made it painfully obvious at every level he was dangerous. He essentially did nothing to hide it. The context of marriage itself like the understanding that it's relatively permanent, can lead a person to ignore warning signs in a futile hope that their partner will change. Those are my thoughts on the case of Robert Bierenbaum. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a Tarasoff exception. Thanks for watching.